Hi, Adrian. Uh, thank you for allowing us to come to beautiful Sofia Antipolis to do this interview with you. So I know I'm in an office where a lot of the standardization work has been done, especially for 5G and IoT. And there is a question that in Seagulls we're really wondering, and whether you believe in this, will 5G and IoT get paid? Basically, will, will paid off 5G and IoT? I mean, that's a great question. We, we would have to wait and see exactly what will happen. It's very hard to predict the future. Um, but for sure, there's some very large ambitions here. Uh, if you look at the investment from all industry sectors who are converging now on this concept of 5G, we have governments who are um, putting their hopes into 5G, uh, creating a level of competition even between nations with uh, premiers competing to be the first to have a, a nation that launches 5G. So yes, we've built up a huge expectation for 5G. Will it deliver on that promise? As I say, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, my own personal view is yes. And I, I say yes for one very specific reason. If you look at the other telecommunications chains, you tend to have big investment at the beginning to install a new system, and then you hope to get 20 years life out of that system, and then you have to replace it. And industry at large has been following this sort of iterative pattern now uh, since the beginning of time. What the mobile communications industry is offering here is a chance to move on to a platform which is continuously being upgraded. So a platform where you continue to invest each year a little bit to keep your system up to date with frequent new releases and software upgrades, um, by which means you're always current and up to date, rather than having this big outlay at the beginning and over a 20 year period your system becomes old, old-fashioned, uh, inefficient and, and basically redundant. So I think we're offering industry at large an opportunity to completely change the way they provision their needs um, based on the success that we have demonstrated in the mobile industry. So it's the journey basically, right? It's the journey, yes. Okay, so going into the, into the ecosystem of IoT, we know that IoT uh, became mainstream today. What's the status there in terms of rollouts and, and what's out there on the market to your knowledge? I mean, at least from a 3GPP point of view, we have two market offerings. We have narrowband IoT and LCEM, both of which are fully standardized, standardized they're deployed, uh, and to a large extent, they are doing today what needs to be done today. So they are satisfying uh, today's market needs. So Adrian, knowing that LTM and narrowband IoT are actually a mainstream today, what is the actual difference with 5G IoT, what 5G IoT represents? I mean, there's a huge difference. If we look at LTEM and narrowband IoT, these are two solutions that were afterthoughts, if I can use that expression. 2G, 3G and 4G were never designed with IoT in mind. IoT was something that came after those releases were, uh, were finished effectively. Now, for the first time with 5G, we have a release which is specifically designed to meet IoT needs. And this will bring two very interesting attributes which the predecessor technologies cannot deliver. The first is low latency and ultra-reliable reliability. Now, there are certain market seg segments that want this ultra-reliability and very low latency. Narrowband IoT and, and LTEM cannot do that. 5G will be able to do that. And the other attribute which is equally important is this concept of massive IoT. Whereas today we have IoT being deployed in, in small amounts, it's starting to grow and cities are developing um, smart metering systems and we're seeing the sort of the early stages. We cannot say today that we are at a scale of, of massive IoT. That may take many years to actually achieve. But when we do get to massive, we know that today's solutions would not be able to cope with that. Because massive, the concept of massive, brings at least two very uh, difficult challenges which we have to cope with. Uh, we have to be able to address all of those devices, so we need to have a naming and addressing scheme that is scalable enough to be able to communicate with all of those devices. Um, so we, we, we need to be able to talk to them in groups, we need to instruct them when they should provide their updates back to the, to the system. Because if all of the smart meters in a city were to provide their updates at the same point in time, 
the networks would crash. We cannot cope with that. So that's the first uh, most important attribute. Um, the second important attribute of the concept of, of massive is the volumes of data that will be required to be, be catered for. And again, today, today's solutions would not be able to cope with that. So as we head towards 5G, for the first time we have a generation that's specifically designed for IoT, designed to cope with the massive in massive IoT, and designed to deliver ultra-reliability and low-latency communications. Mm, moving the gears towards 5G now. So what is the 5G status in terms of deployments today as from your perspective? So what do you see today on the market, not from standardization perspective, this more or less we know it's a non-standalone, what is deployed, but what do you see out there? Are actually operators picking up and in which volume? Yeah, I think that's actually a, an interesting question too, because um, when we first set out to write the 5G standards, industry built their plans about deployment and they set as a clear target that they wanted to deploy in 2020. So we were all aiming for the first deployments to take place within 2020. What we actually see though is because of this competitiveness and demand and pent up uh, uh, interest in deploying 5G, we've seen the first launches taking place in the first half of 2019. Um, so actually the deployments are well ahead of the initially planned schedule. Uh, we saw deployments in South Korea, we've seen deployments in other Asian countries, we've got deployments in, in Europe, uh, we've got deployments in the UK. Um, we know that by the end of 2019, again ahead of schedule, we're likely to have something in the order of 100 commercial networks already launched. So from my point of view, that I, I, I can understand now why such pressure was placed on the standardization machinery to deliver those results ahead of schedule. Because although we made good plans five years ago, those planes have to be adaptable. And, and, and they have adapted because we now see that industry has launched uh, so far ahead of the initial schedule. So now that we have more or less non-standalone, let's say in 100 markets already today, and rolling out more and more capacity and coverage, what is the actual motivation for the end user? How do you see that? Is it really the enhanced mobile broadband that will drive 5G from user perspective, or it will be more that the operator actually moves and transitions the customers to that 5G access and then giving the operator an ability to do new services on top of the new core? Yeah, I'm not sure I see a, a consumer drive for 5G right now. Uh, if you look at the 4G deployments we have in most markets, they are mature networks delivering an incredibly good service. So apart from the, the fashionable fact of, of being able to say to your colleague in the pub, I have a 5G phone, yeah. um, I don't really see a strong um, consumer pull mm -hmm. to say I want a 5G phone. Um, so I think it's fair to say it's more an operator push saying to consumers, we now have this 5G phone which will be better than what you've got, go and try it. And I think that's reflected really in the price points. If you see how 5G is being deployed, it's not that operators are asking a huge amount of money more. Um, I mean, of course, the operators have other reasons why they want to move towards 5G, which go beyond performance. Maybe they have a capacity crunch they have to solve. But in summary, I don't really see a big consumer pull when we're talking about mobile broadband. Part of mobile broadband is also the fixed wireless access, right? So. How do you see this moving? We know in US a lot of this is ongoing, but how do you see this revealing in other markets such as Europe, for example? I mean, I think within Europe it, it, it offers a very good alternative to how you provide coverage in rural areas. So we know that over time um, governments are particularly sensitive to the fact that cities are getting a fantastic service and those living in rural areas, if they lucky, get a service at all. So we have to re reduce the difference between the haves and the have-nots. Um, one way to do that, of course, is using wireless in the last mile. Now, this can be a much more effective, cost-effective solution than digging up the roads and putting fibre to, to every home. Um, so I think, yes, fixed 5G wireless does have... Uh, a, a role to play and it could be a very good solution providing that additional coverage in areas that today have either no coverage at all or very poor coverage. One of the promises of 5G is also that it will address a lot of the verticals. What is your take on the actual motivation of the verticals 
why they would move to 5G and what is the actual vertical that you believe it will benefit the most and what are the key enablers for the verticals basically to, to jump on the 5G wagon? I mean, that's a big question and a, and a complex question to answer because um, w which vertical is going to be the, the, the most attractive, the most lucrative, the most successful, uh, of course, is a question that everybody wants to have the answer to. And it depends very much in which geography we're talking. So I don't think there is one particular sector that will be universally successful throughout the globe. So you have to look at each spe specific country of deployment, look at the conditions prevailing within that country, and then you start to get some idea about which of the verticals um, are not likely to be most successful. And of course they all have their own peculiarities. Um, but why I think it's going to be successful at all uh, is the evidence we see in the population within our working groups in the standardization mechanism. In the past the standardization groups would have been populated by the usual telecommunications players as you would expect, the household names that we've known and loved for the last 20 years. If you look today, that population has changed considerably. So we have directly participating within the standardization groups representatives from farming, from health, from automotive, from maritime, from mining, uh, all manner of uh, industry sectors which you would never imagine would want to directly participate in a telecommunication standards project. Why would they do that? Okay. Moreover, if you look at the cost of doing that, it, it's pretty high. I mean, to send a delegate to a 3GPP working group and to follow that group throughout the course of the year, you have to dedicate a staff member, pay his salary, pay a lot of travel. It's not an investment you would make lightly. And my contention is that industry is making those investments because they have a very serious interest in deploying the end result. So this is something we haven't seen to this scale before. And for me, this is the evidence that says that there is real possibility here that industry is going to deploy 5G as a solution for their industrial sectors. So you're right. If they're already present in the standardization sector, that means they already clear out their use cases and business cases. Now it's a matter of, I guess, standardizing those efforts and understanding more on how that technology can really be implemented. Yes, at least it shows that they have a serious interest in, in doing this. Of course, the, the big question is, will the service be offered to them in the terms and the conditions at a price which is attractive to them? And we haven't really got to that crossroads yet. So the first stage is to make sure that the technolo technology is able to deliver the capabilities that these industry sectors need. The second question is, how are those capabilities offered to the, to the end user? Uh, under what terms and conditions and at what price? All right, staying on the topic, we're, you know, in, in Seagos, we are thinking that 5G roaming will happen faster than LT roaming due to the fact that how many operators are already rolling out and due to the fact that there is no big technological change in the roaming architecture on the non standalone. What do you think? Will 5G roaming actually happen faster than LT roaming? Will it just be enabled? Uh, I mean, I don't think it will happen any slower <laughs> than, than 4G roaming. Okay. Uh, I mean, 5G without roaming uh, has very limited application. So I think everybody will assume that from day one they will have roaming capabilities. And the faster we get those roaming capabilities rolled out, the faster we will see the success of 5G. So I think it's in, in, inevitable that that roaming challenge will have to be tackled at the very first instance. Since we're coming from the service assurance industry, what do you think that as a service assurance vendors or in the ecosystems of service assurance, what is the actual future for the service assurance vendors? Do you, do you believe there is a, a future in the new technology? Is this changing? What is the message that you would give to, the, to our industry? And I think you've probably heard this said many, many times that 5G is not like any previous generation. And in this particular context, that statement is equally valid. That if we look at 2G, 3G and 4G, the, the main premise of those deliveries was that it's a best effort on the operator's part to offer to the end user the best capabilities that they can uh, under, under normal conditions. Now, for the first time in 5G, that won't be good enough. You will have to actually guarantee the service you deliver. And if challenged, you'll have to demonstrate that you are delivering the performance that the customer is paying for. So this is a complete change of concept about um, service level. 
where for the first time you've actually got to demonstrate to, to your customer that I am delivering what you, you are paying for. Um, so I think for the service assurance industries like yourselves, I think this is a, you know, a whole new game uh, which gives you enormous opportunities to, to use your previous knowledge gained in 2G, 3G, 4G and apply that now in a different context within 5G. As a last question, uh, I know you've been a lot busy working on release 16 and 17. What are the insights that you can share on release 16 and 17? Well, I think I'd rather first summarise release 15 and 16 because they go together as a pair. So yeah. when we started 5G, um, we said that the work was, was too much to be done in one release. We divided it into two parts. Those parts are release 15 and release 16. So by March of 2020, when we've completed release 16, we will have then a complete package uh, which provides 5G to, to industry. But that's only the starting point. We can say we've started 5G when those two releases are complete. What release 17 will offer is the industrialization of release 15 and release 16, largely characterized by enhancements for IoT, which reflect the requirements which we are now receiving from the industrial sectors. Now, one problem we see with that is that We've been very successful in attracting industry to come to 3GPB and bring their requirements to us. This means that if we look at the catalogue of requirements to go into Release 17, we have about this much. Mm -hmm. But our capacity within Release 17 is about this much. So we now face a very difficult problem of saying, well, how do we prioritise all of this work which industry have said they want us to do, knowing that we cannot do all of that within Release 17. So we're going to have to look very closely now at what are the priorities, which of the use cases uh, are, are, have the most solid business case, which are most urgent, which are most likely to be deployed first, and make sure then that we write the standards in a, in a chronological order that meets the requirements of industry. So we're, we're heading really for sort of some very tough discussions here uh, because we cannot do everything at once. Adrian, thank you very much for this interview. It was a pleasure. Mine too. Thank you.